This is a production of Cornell University. Um, this is the third installment of our ERP webinar series. We've done uh, a webinar on irrigation management with Rick Slattery, former superintendent. Uh, learned a lot from his uh, you know, long career in, in turf. We did a nutrient management webinar where I talked about a bunch of BMPs in our project um, there. And then today we're gonna have Frank Rossi talk about pest management BMPs. So talking about uh, responsible chemical use and um, all the practices associated with that. So uh, with that, Frank, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Carl. Um, and welcome everyone, uh, whether watching live or uh, recorded. Um, I have to say that this project with my colleagues um, here at Cornell, Carl and Rick Slattery retired from the Locust Hill Country Club and our colleagues at the Pollution Prevention Institute, Gene Park, um, Mia, Selena, Ken, all the people, all the interns that have worked with us. A big shout out to everybody that's uh, really helped bring this together. I, I can say it's really a, a wonderful model to consider uh, serving the citizens of the state of New York uh, with this particular form of land use and the way we'd like to have people do it. All right, let me see if I get my slides advanced here. Well, just uh, <laughs> I'll embarrass my colleagues. Here they are, Rick, Rick in in, uh, in younger days and and Carl this past weekend uh, bringing home the Mid Am, the New York State Mid Am Championship. So we are steeped in golf. I've been uh, working on golf courses for forty years. Rick about 50 uh, and Carl's been playing golf uh, since high school. So he's been at it quite a bit himself. Lots of experience here. And that's been really important as we reflect on previous surveys that may have been done uh, of the golf industry in this space, uh, but, but also um, maybe looking at things in a more comprehensive way. Rick, uh, very uh, business-minded, economic-minded, about being efficient uh, on the golf course. And, and Carl really from the front of the house perspective and the golfer experience perspective, I think we really got a, a really important team here. We can continue to do uh, really good work as long as I can put up with Rick and his stinking Red Sox. Nevertheless, this is really all built up around the uh, codifying of these environmental standards uh, led by Ken Benoit and many in the New York Golf Course Foundation years ago. We wrote these things, and I think ultimately we always believed that we needed education and support to get them adopted. And I think uh, Ken and the years we spent getting this going has really helped adoption. Uh, but I think the project we're talking about here, uh, centered in a section of the state in Western New York, very different than the downstate uh, emphasis that the BMPs initially started with, we wanted to explore the 200 or some odd golf courses that were available to us in the western part of New York State here, western central Finger Lakes, depending on how you like to classify it. And, and essentially, for those of you who haven't joined us before, you know, we wanted to make sure we knew what the BMPs were. What were the things that would indicate the important BMPs? And then Ask people, are they implementing those BMPs? Now, once we get the data back from that, then we're in the phase right now where we're encouraging adoption. We're putting out resources, holding webinars, uh, developing publications. And then uh, in, in a month, in months, uh, a year from now, we'll then say, hey, did what we do improve the adoption of these practices that essentially the law doesn't make you do, right? We're looking at, will, will our industry adopt some of these things voluntarily? So we went around and asked a bunch of questions. Uh, many of you, again, may have seen this. Here's some of the fertilizer and pesticide questions. And when we went out and got our surveys and did this work, uh, Carl and Rick especially went around. Uh, we were doing it remotely during the pandemic and then later on, got some very interesting answers that at least from the pest perspective, I'll talk a little bit about today. So as Carl mentioned, we've already done the water and nutrient webinars. This is the pest webinar. We'll have one more on pollution that'll be very much focused on wash pad uh, and point source issues. But the focus for uh, my time today is with you on pests. Now, 
a lot of things have happened since we started this project uh, 18 months ago. And one of the great things is now we have this wonderful web-based resource housed at RIT and the Galisano Center for Sustainability uh, through the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute. We've got uh, web pages on golf course sustainability that lists all the resources that we've been uh, able to uh, produce so far, uh, videos, publications, uh, none more important than this big old poster you see here to the right. So as I mentioned earlier, we're in the encourage adoption. You know, are you doing this? Uh, how do we help you improve these things? What did our survey say you weren't doing well that we could help you with? And so obviously the uh, poster uh, has been a big part of this. We're going to actually make some bigger ones, starting to see them up in golf course shops, trying to get this in the uh, uh, culture of our industry. Uh, we've been out doing a little bit of field days. We're hoping to do more uh, as the pandemic uh, slows and we're able to get back out. Um, and then, of course, we're also doing some direct assistance projects and brief assistance projects where we're working directly with a client, uh, helping them adopt it, and then hopefully writing it up and getting it out to everyone else. Now, of course, you know me, I don't shut up. We got all kinds of webinars. We had a, uh, a tip of the day. I think we did it 10 weeks in a row this past spring where we were highlighting a particular uh, BMP uh, throughout the season, uh, throughout the spring. So you obviously can go back and see more about that. We're going to revisit that. And so just for today, let's get back to what my job is for today. My job for today is to talk a little bit about this one section of the um, indicator survey that we want to uh, elaborate a little bit more on. All right. Um, of the many brilliant things my colleague Carl has uh, suggested over the years of working together, I would have to rank this uh, among the top. Um, being able to look at how you're doing based on good, better, best, right? You know, there's this little saying, never let it rest until your good is better and your better is best, right? But, you know, so best management practices, right? What we're trying to say is par might be best in some case, might be the best you can do, right? But there are birdies and eagles out there that we can tell you science is saying, this is a, a, a bed, a, the best approach. And if we want to do best management practices, for now, I'm willing to say it's the best you can do. But as we inform and learn more about this, uh, especially with the way we're looking at it as an operation, you know, Rick, from a real economic perspective, environmental perspective, call, call from the golf and environmental perspective and me from, you know, the, you know sort of a little bit about everything. So um, again, here is the pest section and there were three pars, three birdies and two eagles that were listed in this pest section where we say, well, you know, you should be doing these things, right? Making par. Well, it'd be really great if you were doing these birdies and boy, these eagles, are really, you know, where we want you to be. And also you'll see there's a pro tip there. The questions from the pesticide section essentially broke down uh, to these five that we'll focus on a little bit for today. Um, one is we asked, do you apply the majority of your pesticides? Does not apply the majority of the pesticides preventatively, right? So most people are applying them preventatively. Uh, about half and half spot treating. Three quarters are maintaining a 25 foot chemical free buffer. We'll get into this a little bit more. And then uh, there's maintaining a longer vegetation area around there and a documented spill control program. So you can see some are more adopted than others based on our survey results with the way we asked the questions. Now, unfortunately, I'm gonna take a little bit of a left turn here uh, and start with the pro tip not par birdie eagle. And the pro tip here really gets to how do you set up a situation where your grasses can be successful so they don't need chemical pesticides uh, to be applied. And Rick's uh, saying here is, you know, trees don't thrive in the prairies nor grass in the forest. Uh, you've got to have good growing conditions. So um, a pro tip, of course, is going to pay attention to the growing environment, in particular sh tree shade, the impacts that it has. Now, again, Rick being the, uh, the, the MacGyver of the group, 
uh, found himself an app, and there probably are a few out there. Many of you may know about this. Maybe you don't. There are apps you can get on your phone that you just hold it up in the sky, and it gives you a uh, view of where the sun is going to be. It gives you the opportunity to communicate to your members, to your golfers, uh, to your crew, you know, where the trees are impacting light penetration. Now, from a broader perspective, a number of years ago, uh, James Francis Moore, Jim Moore, the old USGA agronomist based in Texas, used to come up here and with that Southern drawl and talk about the grading system they used to have for greens. And I always liked it as a way of really evaluating your site. Now, it could be a green, could be a fairway, could be a tee. There might be different components to this. I'd encourage you to look this up, uh, this particular article in one of the older USGA green section records. And in that article, Jim actually says, okay, if you get, uh, you know, less than four to six hours, uh, if you're at four to six hours of direct sunlight, you're getting a C. So that's not a good growing condition, right? So you'll want to use some of these metrics in communicating how you're going to maybe have to adapt the growing environment. Now, of course, trees also affect air movement. And so, um, now you can go to the trouble of putting fans in, but I would say maybe some thinning of the canopy could go a long way to uh, improving the growing conditions there. Now, another pro tip that's actually associated with what my colleague Rick Slattery talked about earlier in the webinar series about water is that there's no strength without stress, right? If you can stress your turf at the right times where it can tolerate that stress, it will become stronger for the future. Now, if you really want to hear about this, many years ago, I had this chat with Rick on my podcast on TurfNet Radio, where we talked a little bit about his philosophy regarding the way he approached uh, managing the golf course out there. But this picture really typifies a lot of what I believe you'll hear in that podcast and what we're trying to promote with this pro tip. So here you have at the bottom, the bottom white arrow is annual bluegrass population that's being decimated by dollar spot, right? And right above it, you see bent grass above in the top white arrow, the bent grass spreading and thriving, right? Without spraying. So you give a little bit of stress. Now this work's also been done uh, at Rutgers looking at annual bluegrass weevil uh, as a way of taking out annual bluegrass. Some people have talked about using summer patch as a way of taking out annual bluegrass, letting some of these things that you would normally have to spray for that inherently aren't a problem on particular grasses, in this case, creeping bank grass, and let that do the work for you in shifting the competition, making the stress uh, take out the weaker species. So it's a pro tip of you know getting yourself more competitive by having a good site, it's a pro tip on letting your turf be a little bit stressed because it will likely be more resilient later on. And I'll remind you, as Rick did in this slide, this particular damaged area represents a really small section of this particular tee uh, on the golf course. And so will you actually spray all your tees or even this tee just because the back where it's a tight turn is having a little trouble, right? So again, a little bit of stress, uh, not triggering an overall pesticide use is certainly one way of reducing pesticide use. Now, I'll go a little bit further with some uh, slide that many of you might have seen me speak before, uh, have seen me talk about in my work at the Vineyard Golf Club with Jeff Carlson and now Kevin Banks. Many years uh, early on in the study of, of the, uh, in the development of this organic golf course that doesn't use synthetic fungicides, um, they were having grub problems. And every, it, invariably, they would have to re-sod some tea areas. So what you're looking at here is some sod that's been damaged that was laid in June of 07 and photographed in July of 08. And it, you can see the damage from dollar spot that is not occurring on the original L93 that was seeded in August of 01. That's become more resistant over time that the diseases have selected for the strongest varieties out there, right? So they don't have synthetic fungicides and likely the sod that came from the mainland had synthetic fungicides on it. So the second year 
when the fungicides weren't used, all you have remaining here are those parent types or those resistant types that exist in the bent grass sod. And eventually over time, you'll develop a population of plants that are highly resistant to particular diseases. So again, you can only see this if you let some stress happen. Now, just a point of order here, allowing your golf course to look like that sod on the left probably isn't the best idea unless like the, the vineyard club, you're forced to do it. So obviously communicating this and doing it strategically throughout the golf course is going to be really critical to ensure, ensuring, you know, the overall success of this practice, right? So again, another uh, BMP from not the pest section, but relates directly to the pest section is improving the competition. And I mentioned that earlier uh, with getting a good site. And then it's allowing some stress to come in, right? That gives you a more competitive stand. And now what about actually using and intentionally installing the latest turf grass varieties that for pesticides have really been improved to be more resistant? Now, again, we use this from a water perspective, thinking that you'd plant, you know, varieties that would require less water, but you also see in this birdie, right? Maybe a step up where you can reduce pesticides and fertilizers. Now, the really beautiful thing I'll commend you to here is if you're on Twitter or social media or you read anything from the USGA and you search Corning Country Club or John Hoyle, H-O-Y-L-E, John has embarked upon a multi-year plan at Corning Country Club to spray out the Heinz 57 mix of grasses in his fairways that have caused him nothing but trouble, lots of spraying, lots of uh, inconsistent conditions. And he embarked upon a multiple year plan with the club to spray out the existing grasses and then several fairways a year, install the latest bent grass varieties. And again, I could probably talk and John has given presentations on this, but it's a real good example of working with your club to get varieties out there that might help you with pesticide use. So how do, what, how do you sell this from a pesticide perspective? I'm gonna talk about predicting risk and using models that tell us when diseases are likely to occur. We're gonna talk about that in a second, but it's, in, it's important here to understand when the environment uh, changes and becomes conducive for a disease, we can measure how much pressure that's going to be, what the likelihood of you having that disease is likely to be. And we would call that a threshold. And we would say, well, if you have a low threshold, you've got to spray sooner. And if you have a high threshold, you can wait to spray, right? It means the, the pressure that the grasses you have there uh, can tolerate the pressure is greater that the grasses you have there might be able to tolerate. So Carl looked at a bunch of data using the Smith-Kearns model, one model that's used to predict diseases, over a nine-year, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight-year eight period, right, where you see every year there is an increasing amount of dollar spot pressure and then a decreasing amount of dollar spot pressure. So let's say you had that Heinz 57 mix that John had out there at Corning Country Club. And he would get dollar spot, and I'm making this up as a hypothetical, but you know the point I'm trying to make. We certainly have this at, at Cornell University Fairways. We have susceptible varieties where when it gets to about 20%, we're probably going to get dollar spot. We better spray if I don't want a lot of damage, okay? Once I put in a new variety like John's doing, that have come from dollar spot resistant material. Now, if I use a model to spray, my threshold could go up to 40 to 50%. Now look at the difference in the amount of time I'd have to spray. There would be two years in a row here where I literally wouldn't have to spray my fairways at all. Three years, four years out of eight. Even if you, you, know, you pinch uh, 2017 or 2016, you're seeing very little periods of time where you actually would need to spray. So again, Carl did some economics here, looking at $250 an acre 
25 acres of fairways, an old variety of six apps, new variety of three apps. Look at how much money you basically save 50% on just costs by putting in a new variety every single year you're saving that, right? And that's if you had to make three apps. What if you didn't have to make any? So again, having competitive grasses in there is a birdie. It is a birdie, but it can result in significant cost savings. All right, so let's get into the actual BMPs here uh, that we're going to want to cover uh, related to pesticide use. The first is a basic PAR. Welcome to the buffer zone. And again, if you go back into the BMP documents that have been developed and available on the website, you'll see these graphics about different ways of approaching limited spray, no spray around a protected area, right? So we're saying that a PAR is about a 25 foot chemical free buffer. Now, our survey said 70% of the golf courses are currently starting to do this. So this is a real uh, positive result so far of the things that we're doing. Now the 2.0 from a PAR to a birdie, now we're talking about longer vegetation around water bodies that even if you treat out here in fairways and tees and playable rough, you've got an even longer buffer zone that, and also that, that prevents pesticides and fertilizers potentially from getting to that water body, but more so that you have these wide areas, right? Where you move the maintenance from, look at all the trimming here on the right around the body of water and all the change. This is at the preserve at, in, in Greenville, South Carolina, where uh, Adam Charles has uh, an, uh, so much buffer area through that golf course. He estimated he, he had almost six to eight full-time people that their entire seasonal job was to keep that area clear from, uh, you know, maintained like it is on the right. And by doing that, he was able to reallocate some of that labor. And that's a really important component of these buffer strips, not just to prevent runoff from getting in there, not, not just from reducing the pesticide use in those areas, but also the labor associated with maintaining these areas to the standards on the right. Okay. One of the things I love to do, I get to do in this project a lot is hang out with Rick Slattery on Tuesday mornings. And once we get through a little bit of golf chatter and giving each other a hard time about the Red Sox and Patriots and the Yankees. Uh, one of the things he really beats the drum about is why do you run out there and do things early in the spring in the Northeast when there really isn't much pressure, right? There probably are, you can wait, wait, wait quite a long time until you really need to start intervening on some of these practices, right? And so if you have the ability to avoid preventative sprays, right? We had a really low adoption. A lot of people are preventatively spraying. Now there's a couple of things going on here. If a lot of our survey, um, uh, the people that we surveyed were on what we would call small operations, mom and pop operations, right? They're just routinely treating their putting surfaces because that's a very small area and it's high value to them. They're not out on the golf course spraying fairways, rough, far rough, right? Maybe a tee here or there, maybe a weed areas here or there. But in general, you know, many people were answering preventatively from both the private and the public sector uh, because the public sector, even with low inputs, are still treating their greens preventatively. Now, one of the things I want us to think about is, is thinking about um, how you use your pesticides on large areas, not necessarily your putting greens, right? So if you're talking about three acres of your putting greens, right, that's a very different situation than 25, 30 acres of fairway treatment for dollar spot or anthracnose or something like that, right? So one of the things we want to get everybody thinking about is if you look at when you're likely to get a disease, whether it's in Ithaca or on Long Island, right? From a dollar spot perspective, there's data to demonstrate most of the time 
you probably don't have to start treating until a little bit later on. Now, at our forecast website, at our forecast website, we have an ability to look at various intervals back and forward with, a, with predicting what's going to happen, um, depending on your location. So when you look at the season-long dollar spot risk estimates, you can see here in May, there is very little need for dollar spot. But then look what starts to happen. We had a lot of dollar spot pressure uh, this year based on our forecast model. And I think our models indicating this year, there was a lot of pressure. So what you want to be able to do to reduce overall use when possible is to know where your thresholds are, determine when you have to might need to start spraying preventatively, and then monitor those things to see if they're real issues. So I think it's really important for us to use this as a baseline. When is your pressure low and avoid using the products at that time. Now, spot treating, another par, strategically applying pesticides only to areas under high pressure to reduce pesticide use and save money. Now, this goes uh, part and parcel a little bit when pressure is low. So let's look at what the surveys uh, said here. Basically, it looked like about 55% of the folks were spot treating. Now, when we look at that a little more closely, we see it's equally dispersed, right? Equally dispersed between the private and the public guys. Now, I'll draw your attention also to the preventative pesticide answers. Most of the private sector folks we surveyed said preventatively. And the question was, do you apply pesticides preventatively to the majority of your golf course? A majority of your treated acreage and the private sector uh, currently, you know, certainly uh, said they used it more preventatively public a little bit down, but still almost 70% of the public mom and pops are applying preventatively, preventatively, but likely to putting greens. Now spot treatment was 50, 50. Now I think somewhat in the public sector, uh, our discussion amongst Carl and Rick and I is this might be weed centric, herbicide centric. Many people will spot treat for weed control. We want to challenge you to think about this a little bit more, but let's start with the PAR. First off, why would you spray and try to reduce your fairways first? First, greens generally on a per acre basis uh, consume the most pesticide risk right? Because it's a lot of pesticides on a small area. But fairway use has the largest cumulative applications. You're applying the most materials to your fairways. And Carl uh, was involved, Carl and I were involved in a scholarly publication that you can find um, that was peer reviewed recently with our colleagues in Wisconsin. And one of the things that was really clear, if you apply to fairways less, you're going to save more money. Fairways are large areas, it's, it's uh, labor savings, and also the largest risk savings. So if, if you can pay attention to risk, you can reduce it uh, by, you know, treating your putting surface, right, and not worrying about the fairways as much. Okay, so uh, more about spot treating. One of the things is pretty common on annual bluegrass weevil uh, is to just treat the perimeter. Uh, maybe you have some low-lying fairways, um, certainly like we've seen a lot this past year with the rainfall, where you get a little bit more pythium on those fairways than you do anywhere else. But again, instead of looping every or treating the entire fairway for ABW, maybe you go to 12 acres, uh, instead of treating all the pythium, you only go to the really wet spots. Again, there are micro uh, climates that you might get. And this is some work that's been going on in Wisconsin for a little while that Paul Co Co talks about the pathologist out there where the ninth hole has lower dollar spread pressure than the 18th hole. So they're able to make some decisions based on pressure, maybe based on your use. This is from some uh, work we've done on the RTJ golf course here at Cornell, where we've GPS tracked golfers and see where they hit the ball. So maybe you might only treat your landing areas, 
where the majority of your play is. Um, and of course, the classic way or the high end way, the eagle way of reducing pesticide use by spot treating is, of course, the adoption of GPS sprayers. Right now, we've done a little bit of work partnered with Frost Incorporated from Minnesota uh, at its Skinny Atlas Country Club, where the geometry saved us 17 percent on the amount of product that we used. And when we put in labor costs, the return on investment was between uh, was a bit, was less than two years based on product savings. Labor costs, because of the way they sprayed, was a significant reduction from what they were doing previously. So this is an eagle, right? We don't expect everybody to go out and get a GPS sprayer, but we might expect you to be a little bit more careful about the way you spray when you get out there. Now, let's talk a little bit about how spot treating that's a par and scouting that's a birdie can go hand in hand in reducing your pesticide use. First off, you know, the classic, are you using a check plot? How do you know if you needed to spray if you don't have an area with disease that you don't treat? You know, I think this is one of those things that unlike weeds where you spray them and you see them die or you know, insects are a little bit like this. You spray, you don't really know if you needed it or not. But with diseases in particular, it's really useful to have an untreated control to look at and understand what your pressure is. So that's a really good birdie here. Now, less pounds on the ground ties in with scouting it out. How do we scout areas, spot treat to you put less pounds on the ground? Well, I'm going to use our work that Carl and I have been working on with the state park golf courses for a number of years now, where we look at the risk associated with all their pest management programs, right? And we've been looking at it now for close to a decade. This is an example of some data from the first seven years of the trial, where we were able to associate a significant amount of the risk associated with all of our pesticide risk with two pests, annual bluegrass weevil and dollar spot. In fact, in 2014, almost 60% of all the risk associated with our pest management program was with annual bluegrass weevil and dollar spot. And so we had embarked on a multiple year study trying to get the golf course, the state park golf courses to scout more and soap flush more and pay attention to the population more and choose products differently and target those things differently because survey data was showing we were spraying a lot of insecticides. Now, again, pressure on Long Island might be higher than it is in Western New York, but I can tell you, I certainly know superintendents that deal with annual bluegrass weevil this far north. So, so with that as a backdrop, oops, sorry, we were able to promote scouting techniques, put jugs of soap in people's in the back of their cart, get people to actually write down what they are doing, and then look at pesticide selection and rotate those products to avoid resistance, manage resistance, and reduce overall pesticide use and, 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 and uh, risk. And what we found, again, this is a birdie, but for from this perspective, it's an example of a scouting, reducing the number of fairway treatments by 39% over a seven year period, reducing the acreage by 23% and reducing the overall pesticide risk by 65%. So we are choosing less risky products and we're using them at lower and lower rates, right? So. A nice birdie is scouting, spot treating, and choosing products that you can use at lower rates. All these things tie together as a suite of practices that can be a par, a birdie, or even in the case of a GPS sprayer, all the way up to an eagle as a way of reducing overall pesticide use, targeting that pesticide where it's needed, and maintaining the same level of efficacy with the products. Now, predicting the risk that we've talked about earlier, we list as an eagle in our suite of practices here. 
I've already talked about the Smith Kearns model. You're aware of the Turfgrass forecast website that we have uh, at our Turfgrass, uh, Cornell Turfgrass website. And it's our, our model at the Cornell website is different than the Smith Kearns model. This is the one that's used more commonly. And it's just very good to understand what this model is. It essentially is the environmental conditions, which are mostly temperature and length of leaf wetness. The longer it stays wet in the canopy, the more likely you are to have foliar disease problems across the board. I don't care what they are. When it's really cool, it could be microdokia patch. When it's a little bit warmer, it could be dollar spot. It gets a little bit warmer, it could be brown patch. When it gets really warm, it can be pythia blight or gray leaf spot, right? So when you think about conditions that are conducive for foliar diseases, that's what this model does. It tells you, yeah, based on temperature and amount of leaf wetness, you're going to start to get dollar spot right around this point here. And then the dollar spot model shows that it, the risk is increasing and then it gets to a peak and starts to decrease. Now, what we've learned is as it starts to decrease, you could actually back off spraying. And in this case, let's say we did that. Our model says, I don't really have to worry for another five or six or eight days at a 20% spray threshold. If I go up to 30% or 40%, the whole idea changes. But what we're trying to encourage here as a reach for an eagle, is to begin to use and look at these models as ways of determining the way you want to spray. Now, do you have the flexibility to go out and spray whenever you want? Not likely. So you do have particular constraints around this. Do you have the labor to go spray whenever you can? You may not. So using this risk, even if it's a way of narrowing the period of time you have to treat, is really important to begin to start to adopt. And finally, as I wrap up, before we start to take any questions, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, this wonderful resource that we've developed that meets an eagle, but is relatively straightforward to do. And that is having a written spill control procedure in the case of an emergency. We were very surprised to see the adoption of this particular uh, in indicator for BMP so low. It was actually not common to see a spill drill. So on the website, you can go to uh, look at our checklist and it's available to control, contain, contact and get more information and then clean up the area. So we have this little checklist here that you can make into a placard uh, and then have next to where you spray so that if something happens, you know how to deal with it. This is an eagle, but it honestly, it, you know, if Carl was playing, it would be a 480 yard par five. It's a guaranteed eagle uh, for, for our mid-am champion, uh, Carl Scamenti. So I want to believe this is, this can be a, a gettable eagle for everybody uh, listening today. Uh, so I'll remind you one more time uh, of the website that's available for you to get more information about that and hope whether you're watching live or you're, um, watching it recorded, that you reach out to us, uh, give us some feedback. Uh, we're always happy to hear from you and let us know successes, questions that you have. And I guess, Carl, for me now, I will stop sharing and look at you and say, do we got any questions, uh, clarifications or comments that either you or Rick want to make to color in some of the lines here? Yeah, so I think I'll start with a question, Frank, while we're waiting for some of our live audience to get theirs in. Um, so say I'm watching this and I haven't heard many of these BMP, BMPs before, like even if you're talking about some of the PARs, like spot treating or, or control plots. Um, so I see all these things and let's say, okay, yeah, I sh I, I'm kind of hearing these things. I want to do them. What's the first step? Should I try and do all of these BMPs all at once? Are there, should I, should I kind of dip my toe in the water? What's the best process for me if I'm hearing this newly as a superintendent, what's the best process for me to start embarking on this, this kind of BMP journey? I would say the place to start, thanks for that question, Carl. I would say the place to start is to start, my, my, my opinion is to start monitoring pressure. Really get a handle on the kinds of pests that you're going to struggle with, 
Find areas that you're not going to treat as intensely that are low stakes areas, areas that if you lose a little bit, it's not too bad. You know, maybe the front end of a fairway, maybe the back of a tee, like Rick showed in that great slide. I would start. And one of the things that bugs me sometimes, Carl, is we don't even know because we spray preventatively so much. We don't honestly know what the pressure is. Now, that's not fair either. I go to places where, like you do at Beth Page, the line of insecticide where grub damage is right on where they, you know, right on where the line is, right? And one side where they don't treat. So you have problems that are endemic. And it's good to understand what they are, but not everything is like that. So what I think I would start with is monitoring that pressure. And then I would simply take Rick's advice and not do anything in the spring in some of those areas and see what happens. And I think what I've learned, Carl, and then why I'm starting here is that when I worked with some guys in Cape Cod that couldn't spray abruptly, had their pesticides taken away from them abruptly, one of the things that I heard both my, my buddies there, Bruce and Chris, tell me was, hmm, I never didn't spray before, and I think I'm spraying more than I need to. I didn't think I could get away with this. And so I want to use that as a sort of aha moment. I think that's where everybody needs to start. Because once you start there, Carl, you get in the mindset. And that's what I couldn't really portray in the in the in the in the laundry list of things that we're trying to you know get in the record is is there has to be a mindset and it begins with i want to know what my pressure is i want to know what kind of grasses i want to grow and that's where rick's been really beating the drum don't spray don't grow grasses you got to spray all the time unless you absolutely positively have no other choice number one number two i think rick would also say you'd be surprised how much grasses can adapt to the things that we do now it may get ugly, <laughs> you know, that forgotten tea, an article he wrote a long time ago, but nobody's noticing. Everybody forgot about it. Nobody's said, oh, look at how good this is now. So I, I think it begins with understanding the kind of pest pressures that you have, understanding there are times when that's greater or lesser, depending on the environmental conditions, and then strategically making decisions of the way you want to intervene. Well, let me take a little more data and find out what my ABW pressure is. Let me, let me uh, take a little more data and look at the models and see is the line going up, going down. Or let me take some foo-foo dust that's lower risk, right? A fungicide that might be lower risk and use that when pressure might be a little bit lower, right? And then save uh, maybe other materials when pressure might be higher, uh, depending on efficacy that you get in safety there. So. Start with bigger thresholds, understanding your pressure, getting the right grass, fixing the site, making sure you got a place for the grass to thrive. That's why we started there. Yeah. I could keep going. What do you think? Yeah. I, I think it's, um, so it's interesting. I always try and draw these analogies to sports when we talk about, okay, this coach decided to kick it on fourth and two or, or went for it on fourth and two. And you never really know kind of what it would have worked out to if he had gone for it instead of kicking it. This to me is that situation where you can know both things. If you have a little check plot, you can know, hey, if so I sprayed everything except this thing and okay, it got disease and, and okay, so I should have sprayed. And that's a good communication tool to your membership and, and to people who sign off on your budget. So I, I sprayed and here's what it would have looked like if I didn't spray. Now the flip side of that is I sprayed and they don't look any different. Okay, that's more data and that's stuff I can put into my system and my analytics. And the next time I've got that fourth and two, I can say, you know what, last time I didn't need it. Maybe this time I don't need it. Or I can treat half a fairway here or half a fairway there. Um, I really like that idea of that approach. It, it gives you more information doing the same thing. And you don't have to risk job security right off the bat by not spraying a whole fairway. Just a little 10 foot by 10 foot area that's over right. there and, and give right. you some data. Yeah. I think it's crit critical that it's low stakes to begin with. And I think, you know, even with the buffer zones, right, to that point, um, you know, we're really exploring that. Rick talks a lot to us about that. It's like, well, I started out with a lot and then, you know, you have to tweak it with feedback and, you, you know, you, you do what you can and then you make adjustments. And I think that's, again, it's the mindset of, I, I know what I'm trying to accomplish, which is have more areas around water bodies that I don't have to treat because that's a known risk situation. Yeah. 
<laughs> and so I, well, if you look at the picture behind me, you know, sometimes those areas are in play. So you have to be really thoughtful about the way you approach this. And so here's what I wouldn't do. I wouldn't stop spraying pesticides completely. I wouldn't start, I wouldn't stop mowing large areas of the golf course where the greens committee hits on a regular basis. Those are big things I wouldn't do. And again, I, you know, I would say there are places where you can go a little cold turkey and manage your risk. And I think Rick talked about with water. I think I would use the same philosophy with, um, with pesticides that there probably is some damage. And of course there is this mentality. It's one way of getting the annual bluegrass, the weaker species out of there, but it requires discipline, Carl, and mm -hmm. it's not so easy. So you have to yeah. be able to discipline yourself and make adjustments. Yeah. And the last thing I'd comment there, Frank, is, you know, we were seeing these kind of public versus private differences in some of the BMPs and, and the long grass around a certain area was one of those where we saw it was harder for private clubs to, to do that. And in a lot of those cases, it was because of the greens committees and the, the architects working with the golf courses, wanting the golf course to play a certain way. Um, I would say that it, using data, like you, you talked about the, di the, the preserve six to eight people year round, starting to quantify that sort of thing. Hey, it's going to take X labor hours, which translates to X dollars to maintain that clean look right. versus here's what I could do. And here's how I could reallocate that labor. Not that you have to necessarily argue with, hey, we should let it go long grass, but just presenting those two options, again, using that data as a communication tool, uh, I think could be really powerful if you're trying yeah. to get sort of closer to these BMPs. Yeah, because one of the things that we talk about regularly, Carl, is the adoption of these BMPs isn't something people honestly don't want to do. It's that there really isn't anybody yelling about these things except us. And certainly among the people who it's not on their radar is their golfers, yeah. right? This generally is not something that's being pulled through uh, by the golfers. So um, I'd like us to make sure we're always mindful of the way we communicate this and the importance of doing it in, in, a, in, a, in a planned, uh, intentional way rather than haphazard. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I think uh, no questions, Frank, other than uh, asking what is in your cup and uh, <laughs> what's Frank drinking during the webinar is, is the it's, one. Uh, it's a cup of coffee. I wish it was something at this time of day. It's a cup of coffee. Later today could be something different. Never. Yeah, the caffeine is performance enhancing. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, with that, Frank, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Thanks to our live audience for for being there. I've, I've put links in the chat for our live audience. I'll put those under this YouTube video. So. The things that, that Frank was talking about during the presentation, you'll have those links right down there. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we hope this was educational for you, created some awareness, maybe pushes you towards some of these BMPs. That's uh, what this project is all about. So thank you all for joining. Uh, we'll see you one more time for the pollution prevention uh, webinar where we'll have Rick Slattery again with his uh, practical experience. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.